But today we are in part two of a series that we're calling On the Other Side. This is a series we started right after Easter, and can I be honest with you, I don't know when it's going to end. It's just kind of one of those series, because we thought it would be a series that just as soon as Easter was over, we would step right into the book of Acts, because if you weren't with us before Easter or leading up to Easter, we did a series it's called Out of Nazareth, where we opened the Gospel of Luke, who gives us this beautiful account of Jesus' life, but Luke not only wrote to his friend Theophilus about the story of Jesus, he also wrote the book of Acts which is word for word, the, the, the longest one in the New Testament. And it's, it's all these, it's the acts of the apostles. It's the acts of the early church. And that was our plan. Make a plan and then watch God laugh. <laughs> um, come on, somebody. That's just kind of the way it works. Uh, yeah, there's some people that know that. You're like, yep, know that. But what we noticed is, or what hit me in my heart is Jesus spent 40 days on the other side of the tomb before he ascended that there's this space between his resurrection and his ascension where Jesus walked the earth and engaged his followers and showed up in front of a lot of people. And say amen, if you know, Jesus doesn't do anything without intention. Everything that Jesus does is intentional and it matters and it has purpose. And in this 40 day season that Jesus spent between his resurrection and his ascension, I think those 40 days were as vital to his followers who would be entrusted with what he started as anything that happened in the three years that even leaded up to it. That in these 40 days, these men have been scattered. They have made some really bad choices. They have been, their whole world has been rocked. They are just shook to their core and they're trying to make sense of all of it. And even though they know that Jesus has risen, they know what Jesus has done, but they're still really unsure about what it means for them. And Jesus spends this 40-day period between resurrection and ascension, drawing them back in, trying to convince them that everything is different now. Because on the other side of the empty tomb, everything is different now. Everything has changed for them and for the rest of the world. Sin has been dealt with. The sacrifice has been made. Blood has been shed. And now we don't have to stay stuck, separated from God. We can overcome sin and we can experience life because Jesus has done everything necessary to make it possible. And that's where you shout. And part of this too, he's like, all right, boys, I'm about to ascend back to heaven. So y'all gonna have to get your junk together. Because I'm going to entrust you to be my witnesses, to tell what you've seen and heard. And last week we talked about how he spends a lot of time going back into the Old Testament. And the reason why we should put high value on the Old Testament is because Jesus seemed to do frequently just that. And he, he wanted to make sure that they just didn't know what happened, that they fully understood why it had to happen. Because if they were gonna be good witnesses, they couldn't just go say, yeah, this man named Jesus, who was a carpenter's son from Nazareth, he died on a cross and he rose from the dead. Because the next question for most people is gonna be like, okay, why? And what does that mean? And they needed to have a answer rooted in scripture. And so he spends all this time bringing them back in and having conversations and revealing himself, revealing himself to them in the hopes that their faith is restored, their hope is restored, and that they're ready for that responsibility when the Holy Spirit comes. And there's one man in particular that Jesus has to help understand that he still wanted, he still needed, and God still has a plan for him, and it's Peter. Because on the other side of the resurrection, it seems as if Peter is still trying to figure out where he fits in because he made a really big, big error in judgment. He may had one of the most legendary, embarrassing public sins in all of scripture. I'd say outside of David and Bathsheba, we look at Peter in this way that he is so tainted by his experience. But everything that Jesus does and the way that Jesus pursues him, engages him, and attempts to bring him back in is so beautiful and it's so powerful and every detail matters. And I want us just to lean into his story to recognize who our God is and how he restores people who have fallen. You with me? Say amen. All right, the Gospel of John, chapter 21. 
I'm about to read 19 verses of scripture, and I know in our ADD world that can freak a lot of people out, but I don't ever want us to be this church where a pastor reads one verse and then talks for 45 minutes. It needs to be more about God's word, and I just want to read it, and then we're going to unpack it, learn from it, and just see what God has to do. You with me? Say amen. John chapter 21. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible, if it matters, but if you have a pen ready or you're ready to highlight it in your phone, there's one particular thing that's gonna seem odd when I ask you to circle it, underline it, and remember it, but it'll make sense before we're done, okay? John chapter 21, starting with verse one. It says, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing. Simon Peter said to them, we're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them. You caught any fish? No, they answered. Verse six, well, then cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did. And they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, it's the Lord. When, Pete, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off, and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about 100 yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there. Can you circle or highlight charcoal fire? It says, when they got out of the boat, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and he hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them to be exact. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. And none of the disciples dared ask, who are you? Because they knew, they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Feed my lambs, Jesus told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, you, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, Jesus told him. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. Truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you would die. You would, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you want to go. He said this to indicate what kind of death Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. This is a beautiful moment. This is a beautiful moment where God is doing something very unique and special and powerful in the life of Simon Peter. See, it's, it's, it may seem weird when you're thinking about the context of all this that's happening in the moment that, that Jesus is back from the dead and Peter's reaction is to go fishing. Ain't that just like a dude? I'm going fishing. I, I, I'm just gonna go fishing. And it's, it seems like a very weird response to the news that he's heard. Now remember, he's already seen Jesus in the flesh twice. So it's not like he's wondering or has to question whether or not Jesus has come back from the dead. He's already had these moments where Jesus has sat among them, unpacked the Old Testament to help them see the necessity of all that he has just done. But Peter still has the stench of his, familiar, of his failure in his mind because he had a legendary one. And when you fail like that and it's still so fresh, sometimes the only thing that you, need, you know to do on the other side of failure is to retreat to something familiar. That's what Peter was. He was a fisherman. 
The natural thing to do is just to go, when you fail, just to go do something to take your mind off of it. Maybe even go do something that you used to be successful at so you at least don't feel like the failure that you see in the mirror. Because he remembered, it's not just that Peter failed. He failed so publicly and he had been so defiant that it wouldn't be him. You remember when Jesus is in the upper room and he's talking about all the things that are about to unfold and he says to Peter, Peter, you're gonna deny me before the rooster crows three times, you will declare that you have no relationship with me whatsoever. Three times between now and sunrise when the rooster crows, you are going to deny that you know me at all. And Matthew records Peter's response like this in Matthew 26, verse 35, Peter says, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. You ever did something you said you'd never do? Yes. I'll just go ahead and answer for you. Yes. All of us have done things that we said we would never do. And here in front of all of his friends and in front of Jesus himself, he says, won't be me. It will not be me. We looked at it in Luke, the way Luke records it in Luke 22, 33, when Jesus says, Peter, you're gonna die. And he says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. There's almost a, a twinge of arrogance in Peter's voice, which wasn't, wasn't unlike Peter if we read through his story throughout the gospels. He was, he was so convinced that it would never happen and it seems like he was gonna be the brave, bold one as they move out of the upper room and remember they go into the garden and Judas shows up and he kisses Jesus on the cheek, which was the sign that they had agreed would be how he would indicate who Jesus is and the Roman guards show up to arrest Jesus and he pulls out his sword and goes all ninja and chops an ear off. And Jesus has to correct him, but then Jesus would be led away and it wouldn't take long for just a little bit of distance between Peter and Jesus to lead to a lot less courage. It's amazing how quick courage goes when you start to put distance between you and Jesus. It's amazing how much courage, how much courage comes to proximity with Jesus and how much it goes when separation occurs because it wouldn't be long and, and Luke tells us what unfolds. We read it a few weeks ago, but let's read it again. He's standing there among this group of people and they're beginning to question him and, and ask him if he knows Jesus and says, but Peter said, verse 60 of Luke 22, but Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And that was the third time and it says immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Verse 61, then the Lord turned and he looked at Peter so Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. And we looked at that moment where Luke records that in that moment, it's almost as if Peter and Jesus lock eyes. And I, and I submit to you that when Jesus looked at Peter, the look on Jesus' face was not one of anger. It was not even one of disappointment. It was one of like Peter I knew this was gonna happen and I know you don't understand it right now and I know right now you feel guilt and shame and overwhelmed, but it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay because I'm about to pay for the sin you just committed. He knew it, he knew it. And so now you're just a few days after this and even though he had watched Jesus die on the cross, he had watched his bloody body be pulled off of it and put in a tomb and he had seen the empty tomb with himself and now he's seen Jesus in the flesh. He's watched Thomas put hands on him. He's seen him eat a piece of fish and he knows that he's alive. His still, his natural reaction is to go back to the boat because he is convinced that whatever he had, whatever Jesus had for Peter, was now over because of that failure. But Jesus pursues him. And he shows up on that shore that day because God still had a plan for Peter. But for Peter to walk in that plan, his sin had to be settled and his shame had to be resolved. And see, that, that, that's what's necessary for on the other side of failure, sin has to be settled and shame has to be resolved. 
And that's what Jesus is giving Peter the opportunity to do. And now Peter is going to be the first to tell us, don't use him and his story as, as, a, as a case study for how to abuse grace. Because there is, there's a difference between moments of weakness driven by fear and a spirit of defiance that's constantly chosen by intention. Come on, talk to me. See, restoration requires repentance. And repentance reveals change. And so before we start walking into this story, sometimes we think, well, I'll just sin and ask forgiveness and I'll just sin and ask forgiveness and I'll just sin and ask for forgiveness. And this, it's not moments of weakness. It's not moments where we're given temptation. It is a intentional spirit of defiance that some of us walk into and then we want to run to God for grace and say our sorry. That's the difference between what Paul calls worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Y'all with me? Say amen. Like this is a really important thought that we have to wrestle with as we walk through Peter's story. But what unfolds next, y'all, I'm telling you, is so beautiful. Because what Jesus does, and if we all are in agreement that everything that Jesus does, he does with intention, I want you to look at the pathway that Jesus uses to bring Peter back in. Did you notice what happened? Okay, they're out on a boat, fishing all night, unable to catch anything until the Lord comes up and gives them a new plan, right? Amen? Do you remember how Jesus called Peter to follow in the first place? Because it was just like that. I'll show you. Go back to Luke chapter five. Jesus is just stepping onto the scene and his earthly ministry is just beginning and he's just starting to call people to follow him and build this disciple group that are gonna become apostles that are gonna take the message of Jesus to the world. And I want you to see the deep connection, almost the identical pattern with which Jesus calls him back that aligns with the ways he called him in the beginning. Luke chapter five, verse four, says when he... Jesus had finished speaking. He said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Verse five, master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the, in the other boat to come and help them they came and filled bo both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at his knees and said, go away from me because I'm a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John Zebedee's sons who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. Do you see it? When Jesus is going to invite Peter into a whole new calling, into a whole new life, into a whole new realm of faith like he's never known, it's after a night that Peter's been out with the same guys, fishing all through the evening, unable to catch anything until Jesus speaks and they bring in a catch unlike any they had had before. Now on the other side of his failure, he's retreated back to the life that Jesus called him out from. And once again, he's out on the water fishing all night and he can't catch anything until Jesus shows up and says, hey, let's try it a different way. That Jesus was there to say, what you doing out on the boat, Peter? You can't catch fish because that's not your calling anymore. And you'll never catch anything without me because you'll never be successful or fulfilled without me. That apart from me, this is not gonna be good. That frustration that you feel throwing the nets down all night, pulling them back up and having no fish, that's the frustration you're gonna know forever unless we make this thing reconciled and restored. What you doing out on the boat, Peter? I find it very interesting that the way he called him in the beginning is the exact same way he calls him back. I think that's Jesus' way of saying, I wanted you then and I still want you now. I believed in you then and I still believe in you now. I believe that you can change because of what I've done. I believe things can be different because of who I am. And if you'll just receive it, things can be different. You don't think Jesus did that on purpose? You'd think there would have been a moment when he's like, 
this feels familiar. This is deja vu. When he looked at James and John, he'd be like, does this feel familiar? Because they, they, the, they were the same guys on the boat with him that night. He was saying it not just to Peter, he was saying it to all of them. Come on, come on back. But it doesn't, for some reason, Peter's like us. He's a little hard-headed, a little stubborn. And there comes this moment when John, that's the one that's the disciple that Jesus loved most. That's the way John, that's what John says about himself. Whether Jesus ever said that, I'm not sure. <laughs> but he leans over and says, Peter, it's the Lord. Peter grabs his shirt and does a cannonball into the water and starts swimming, swimming to the shore. And it says they, and it's almost like they, they get to the shore at the same time when you read the Bible because I ain't never seen anybody swimming out on a boat. I wonder if he jumps out of the boat and Peter's swimming, they were about like, you always got to be so extra, man. <laughs> and they get to the shore. And it's interesting what happens next. That Peter has got an opportunity to be reconciled with God. But it's not just that Jesus is extending that opportunity, it's the way in which he's doing it that's really incredible. Because it says that when they get back to the shore, that Jesus has prepared breakfast. But there's a specific way that he's pre prepared breakfast and there's a specific way that John describes it that's super interesting. Go back to John 21, go back to verse nine. Remember I told you, the circle, charcoal fire. It says, when they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Now you might think it's weird that I had you circle charcoal fire. But what's really interesting is there's two places that this idea of charcoal fire is mentioned in the gospel of John. As far as I know, mentioned anywhere in scripture like this. And this is the second this is the second time that Peter will sit around a charcoal fire in just a matter of a few days. Because the, the first time that Peter is mentioned being around a charcoal fire is in John chapter 18. And it's at the very moment that he denies Jesus three times. Go back into John chapter 18. Look with me at verses 17 and 18 as John records this moment of failure that is still burning in Peter's heart as he shows up on the shore of that beach. John says it unfolded like this. John chapter 18, starting with verse 17. It says, then the servant girl who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, you aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? I am not, he said. Now the servants and the officials had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. They were standing there warming themselves and Peter was standing with them warming himself. So there's two places within a handful of chapters that John mentions a charcoal fire. The first is John 18, when Peter's standing around this charcoal fire with this group of people that he doesn't really know, trying to keep his distance from Jesus, but yet still keeping an eye on what's unfolding. And all these people are asking, hey, aren't you, aren't you with Jesus? Aren't you with Jesus? No, 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 no. And then on the morning that Jesus is going to restore Peter and give him an opportunity to come back to the calling that he had for him in the beginning, it says when he shows up on shore, Jesus has prepared breakfast over a charcoal fire. Now, I'm sure there's some scientific terminology for this, but anybody know how deeply connected smells are to memory? Like, there are certain smells that the moment you smell it, it takes you back. Certain scents, there's certain aromas that the moment it hits your nostrils, like all these memories begin to flood your spirit of a significant time in your life or a period in your life, whether it be good or whether it be bad. There are things that no matter where you are, when you smell it, it takes you back. For me, one of those is mothballs and menthol cigarettes. 
because that reminds me of my Mimi's house. Because that's what it smelled like. That, between that and the, right, the white rain, because she was a hairdresser, it's, it took years off my life smelling all that as a kid in the summertime. <laughs> and some people might think of menthol cigarettes and mothballs and go, ooh, I think of Mimi. And something in my heart wells up, right? And I'm sure you got one too. There's some smell that as soon as it hits your nostrils, it floods you with memories and it takes you back to that place and puts you in a certain kind of way. Come on, I say amen. You know it's true. For Peter, unless Jesus stepped in and did something, every time he smelled a charcoal fire, that scent would have served as a memory of his most shameful moment. Until Jesus shows up, says, come on to shore, I'm gonna make breakfast. And when Peter pulled up on that shore, I wonder if he smelled the scent of that charcoal fire. And Jesus says, I'm not only gonna forgive your sin, I wanna take away something that will remind you of it because I don't want it to ever bring you back to that place again and it ever be an obstacle to what I have for you in the future. Isn't that cool? That's how intentional and powerful. Y'all will never look at Kingsford in the same way right after this semester, I know that. But Jesus, I, I, and some people are like, Matt, you're just making too much of this. No, I think Jesus, this is who Jesus is. He doesn't want you stuck in your shame. He doesn't want that sin to be connected to something that will constantly draw you back to it. And so Jesus says, I'm gonna create a new memory. That from now on, when you smell charcoal fire, you'll think of this moment on the beach and you will not think about your sin and your shame. You will think about my mercy and grace and it will keep you walking forward in the life I have for you on the other side. <laughs> on the other side. And from now on, when Jesus is using Peter in a mighty way, this Peter that we'll look at next week who preached the Pentecost sermon, when he's walking through the villages of outside of Jerusalem and he's proclaiming the gospel and he smells a charcoal fire burning in the distance, it won't take him back to that place of shame. It will remind him of that morning when Jesus looked in his eyes and said, Peter, and asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? One ask for each denial to hear from his Lord that he wasn't just forgiven, he was fully forgiven. And this would so radically change Peter's life. Peter would make mistakes after this day. We'll read about him as we walk through the book of Acts, but he never made that one again. That's how, you know, you know how you can know there's a real true repentance? That mistake wasn't repeated. When true repentance happens, so much so that in, in standing for his faith, he would be crucified, but upside down because he could not fathom being crucified the same way as his Lord, that he, did, he, he didn't feel himself worthy. So when they killed Peter for his faith in Jesus, because one day he would have to ask, be asked those questions again and he would not waver and he would not back down and he would die for it, crucified upside down for his faith in his Jesus that he would constantly remember this moment on the beach where Jesus said, when I told you I was gonna call you to catch people, I meant it. So don't go back on the boat. Go walk through these streets, proclaim my gospel, and let them know that what I've done for you, I wanna do for other people. The same mercy and grace that you received, go tell other people it's available to them too. And when you read the part of scripture that we have written by Peter, it hits different in light of all these things. When you go into 1 Peter chapter two and you read verses 21 through 25, where Peter writes, for you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And then he quotes Isaiah. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. When you hear Peter use words like sheep and shepherd and you think of that morning of what Jesus was calling him to, you realize, see, it was on the other side. 
And, and if you go back to when Jesus even predicted Peter's failure, you see that even, even knowing Peter would fail, Jesus still demonstrates a matter of trust and belief in him. There's, a, there's something that Jesus says to Peter in that moment that often gets overlooked. Go back into Luke 22, verses 31 and 32, when he's predicting his failure, when he's predicting these moments when he's gonna deny him. Verse 31 of Luke 22, Simon, Simon, look out. Because Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Now stop right there. When it says that Greek word for you there is not just a singular you, it's a plural you like y'all. He's talking not just about Peter, but all the disciples. But then look what he says now. Look at verse 32. In this moment when he's predicting his failure, he says, Peter, but I've prayed for you. You want Jesus praying for you. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Do you see that? Like Jesus is already pointing to the other side. <laughs> he says, Peter, this, this is what's gonna happen. I know it's gonna happen. You're gonna, you're gonna get consumed by fear. And even in front of some, some people that have no power to do anything to you, you're not gonna be strong enough to identify yourself with me. But I'm praying for you that your faith will not fail, that your faith in my grace and my mercy will be strong enough to convince you you don't have to sit in that shame, that you can step out of it and keep walking toward the calling I had for you the day I called you out of that first boat. I'm calling you, I'm calling you. I'm praying for, I'm, I think when Jesus says, I'm praying for your faith not to fail, I think he was praying for that moment on the beach when he was look at Peter and says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you have enough faith to believe that in me you can overcome this? Do you have enough faith to believe that this doesn't have to be what defines you? Do you have enough faith to believe that you can be known not as Christ denier, but Pentecost preacher? <laughs> Do you have enough faith? He says, when, and when you turn back, strengthen your brothers. Like they're gonna need you. They're gonna need your leadership. They're gonna need you to come in and bring them back. Aren't you grateful for the way our God very intentionally and powerfully calls us back? Amen. Calls us back. If later some people in the room, today's the day God's calling you back. You failed and it was big, and it was bad, and it's awful. And you let the enemy invade that space and move you from just like a, a moment of failure into a, just a pattern of defiance. Because in that shame and guilt, you just thought it was over, and so you're just constantly staying in the weeds of sin. And God's calling you to walk away from that and to step into his grace and to receive his power and his mercy and his spirit, to step out of that place and walk in freedom and victory He's calling you. Some of us, like those things have become these cords that we just stay tethered to and they're keeping us from what God has. And you showed up at church today and Jesus is saying, I wanna take it away. I wanna, I wanna give you a char charcoal fire kind of moment because I don't wanna just take it away, I wanna disconnect you from it so that you can walk in who I want you to be would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me? Would you indulge me for just a few more verses of scripture before we worship and you respond to whatever God's doing in your heart? Hear these words that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter two. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just listen to the gospel. Because then you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as those, as the others were also. Verse four, but God. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. 
For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not from works so that no one can boast. For we are all his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. God has something for you that your shame and your guilt will rob you of unless you let Jesus deal with it. Today's a good day to let him deal with it. To have that repentant spirit, that godly sorrow, to lay down those things and give it to him and allow him to work in your heart and disconnect you from those things so he can set you free towards what he has for your future. Father, I pray that all across this room that you would just begin to work, God, that you would stir in the spirit of your people in a way that so undeniable that it will be evident that you are calling people to step out of whatever old boat they've been sitting in. God, speak to hearts. May your spirit just sweep in this room and to everybody who's under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name we pray.